children's school there in, uh, I can't even think of the name of the place. Uh, Mary <laughs> Thank you, Mary Elba. <laughs> That's right. And we've been supporting a couple of kids there. And who knows, they could be even amongst this crowd. And there's 400 students at Emmanuel <laughs> School with 10 teachers. 10 teachers for 400. Well, you work out the maths on that. And so they've got a job on their hands. And uh, last year, November, Colin Scott from South Australia uh, went to this village, this school, and uh, they saw it, uh, he saw it, uh, classrooms, a fence, and gate completed. It looked really good. Mango trees have been planted. Well, if I plant mango trees, I reckon we're planting them for the fruit, but they're pl planting them for the shade. Yeah. Maybe the birds get all the fruit like they do around here. Anyway, we were so impressed by the passion of the teachers. Each one articulated something special that they were doing to get the best out of their classes. A challenging thing when sometimes you've got 100 students in your class. All right, and there was something else down there that uh, talked about, uh, talked to some of the students and uh, some of the hopes and the fears that they had. Uh, one of them wanted to be a pilot and fly to Australia. And you can imagine that would be the case. In contrast to the norm of getting married young, as they do over there, the students nowadays there at uh, Mary Elba are thinking that uh, they probably wouldn't be married before they're 25. Uh, there was something else that I wanted to share about this, though. Uh, they were worried about, one, some of the students were worried about losing books or pencils or things like that because they knew if they lost them, they wouldn't get a replacement. There were no replacements available. I've grown up in the uh, decade when Australia began to be called the lucky country and not without reason. We've had, uh, I've had a lifetime of plenty and uh, yet I think of other people in other parts of the world who have so little. I'm writing my story and uh, I'm doing a bit of research of course and my forebears and my grandparents and great grandparents pioneering Corndale area in the South Bernard. Sometimes there was no food available. They had to go out and shoot koala bears for their daily food. Sometimes wallabies as well. What a contrast to the world we're living in today. John, there's a copy of that that you've just read up the back. Of and I've heard a few copies, which, thank you, Ron, which leads me to uh, something else. We do have a prayer time after morning tea this morning. And uh, I'll be putting that on the table for prayer. Uh, among other things, I've got something about North Korea here. I've also got something from uh, Tom and Gemma in MAF in New Guinea. We'll share that. And uh, if you've got other mission news, like from the Leprosy Mission Coral, uh, then we'll share that too. We'll have a pinky diet prayer time shortly. Also, on Tuesday night, we have the Wix Bible Studies, KYB and Shibi. And anybody else who would care to join us. Uh, uh, we'll have a look at the timeline of the Bible. We're working our way through the Old Testament, and uh, now we're hastening through the Kings and the Chronicles, that boring stuff, you know, history. So we just want to pick out the highlights, the gems in, in those, and put, put it all together in a timeline uh, leading up to the coming of Christ. Okay, now my 20 minutes is starting at this point, Kim. Right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have delivered us from the uh, consequence of being in the flesh. We're now in the spirit. We're now your children. We've been adopted. We've been ushered into your family. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you for that. And now we pray that you would open your revealed scriptures to us, to open our understanding of it, Help us to get a glimpse of heaven today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A glimpse of heaven. We've been six months leading up to this. I started out asking the question, what is existence? 
How can existence exist if you want to be very philosophical about it? Uh, but of course, uh, ultimately, as we looked at the uh, course of Christian life and the ultimate aim of it, we saw that it was eternal life, and more than that, we'd see that it's heaven. Heaven is the place where we're to spend eternal life. But I balked at uh, preaching this sermon because I really didn't have much information on it. Let's face it, the Bible doesn't say a lot about it. Uh, at one point, Paul was taken up into the third heaven, and you know, read about that, but he never described it in any of his letters. He was more concerned about his own missionary journeys and uh, the trials that he met there and living in the spirit here and now. The uh, writers of the Bible didn't describe for us eternity, eternal life, or heaven. Probably because the words wouldn't make much sense anyway. I think there is a, a verse in scripture, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. I'll read it later on. But I, and I think it's quoting Isaiah 64, I has not seen or ear heard what the Lord has prepared for those who hope in him. Yeah, it's going to be a glorious place, I'm sure. And everybody wants to go there, even if they don't set foot in a church door or bow the knee to Jesus. I uh, realize that America is not a place to compare with the rest of the Western world when it comes to surveys. But I quote this one, and I guess here in Australia it's probably not far behind. But, uh, and I say that because America is still much more Christian, much more Christian than most of the rest of the Western world. But uh, a survey suggested that uh, at least 80% of Americans believe there is a place called heaven. Now, I pause to qualify that when you consider how the once Christian universities in England, Scotland, and then America, Harvard, Yale, all those universe, great universities, founded on Christian principles, have then embraced Darwinian evolution and taught that as if that is the fact. And Christian, Christianity and uh, Genesis is not allowed in any student assignments, not allowed in the classroom. Despite that, most Americans still believe there is a place called heaven, and that wouldn't be allowed if they truly believed Darwinian evolution, right? So that encourages me in one sense, in that while we're drifting away from Bible and Christian ethics in the West, there is still that God-shaped vacuum in our hearts, and as one writer put it, a heaven-shaped vacuum in our hearts. We all want to go there one day, because after all, there's got to be something more, something better, something more than the pain and suffering of this life, right? I, I guess for that reason alone, some people might hope for a heaven, something, some escape from life, that is unsatisfactory here and now. We just have to have a church prayer meeting and we realize how unsatisfactory life is a lot of the time. Joan talked about the bad things and the parallel to the good things that are happening in life. So we want something better. We hope for something better. And we feel in our heart there is something better, a heaven-shaped vacuum. But if you're wrong about heaven, somebody said, if you're wrong about heaven, you're going to be wrong for a long, long time. Think about that. It's all about eternity, isn't it? Eternity. It was that the Ribley sermon that uh, was a fascinating sermon to listen to, and I think we played a little bit of it here a few months ago. Eternity. If we're wrong about eternity, if we're wrong about heaven, we're wrong for a long, long time. So we better do our homework, and we better try and get it right. But the only thing we know about heaven is what we find in the Bible. And so we have to make sure we can trust the Bible. And we here today, uh, I think we would assert that the Bible is true 
and uh, if the Lou Wallaces of this world are uh, right, then we can believe it because the evidence is stacked up in favour of it and its message about the resurrection of Jesus. And if Jesus has been raised from the dead, we do have the hope of being raised from the dead. The first bit about heaven that I want to share with you is in John chapter 14. So some of you will be ahead of me because you've already got your Bibles open there, haven't you? If you're obeying the preacher. Most of you weren't obeying the preacher, I guess. I guess I'm here to rustling the paper. What is John 14 all about? John 14 is about Jesus telling his disciples he's about to go. But he says, uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me. You might say, if you look at the Greek, keep trusting in me. Trust in God. Keep trusting in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you with me that uh, you may also be where I am. Where's that? In heaven. Isn't that exciting? That's our destination. But to the first point that I want to make about heaven is that heaven is a very real place. Very real. Uh, we haven't got much description of it, even in the scriptures. We haven't got any description of it, really. But uh, just statements like this suggesting that it's a very real place. And uh, in line with that, again in John 14, the first two, What's more, heaven is the place where God lives. Oh, he visits earth, and he's here on earth with us. He's constantly taking trips like we at Living Hope constantly do. Where's Neville and Joan these days in Western Australia or something? Well, it's like that with God. He's constantly on the move, isn't he? But uh, he's near as a prayer to any one of us. But the dwelling place of God is heaven, and... Uh, God, of course, is going to live in a very real place. So that's the first two things we can say about heaven. The third thing, it just focuses on you and me. I mean, it's not just the place where God dwells. It's not just high in the sky somewhere. But it's the place where Christians are going to live. Get used to it, folks. We're going to live there forever, for eternity. Put this life behind us, and what's next? Heaven. How do I say that? I say it because of particularly one statement, but there are others. Now I've lost my place there. Philippians chapter 1. Well, I probably won't uh, turn to it. I'll just quote it uh, as I remember it. It says, our citizenship... Got a passport? My passport says Australia. But uh, my heavenly passport says heaven. My citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there. And he's even named the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read it again. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, heaven is a very real place. And it's where God lives. So I hope he's a nice boss. We watched The Devil Wears Prada the other night. It was a movie that came out in the 90s and we thought as good Christians, The Devil Wears Prada, I'm not watching that, and we never did. Uh, we saw it the other night and it's all about this <laughs> high-flying woman, uh, the uh, owner of a, well, a modeling age, well, what do you, how would you describe it's it? A magazine. It's a magazine. The magazine, I suppose, is the focus. The fashion magazine. The high fashion magazine. You didn't take much from the movie then. No. <laughs> uh, don't bother watching it, because you wouldn't want to work with this lady <laughs> and this poor secretary. What's her name? Anne Hathaway. Yeah, she, anyway, she had a hard time. And if God is anything like that, I wouldn't want to go there. And, and I, it made me think of back trims, you know, when I was working at Tile Accessories Warehouse at Nunda. The boss, the owner of the company, lived in Melbourne. Every now and again, unannounced, 
we would see him walking. <laughs> or we better make sure that we've got that horse right, you know. But make sure that that paper is hidden away somewhere, we don't want him to see that. Uh, he could be gruff, you know, he was a, from a European nation, I won't tell you which one. And uh, yeah, he could be quite fearsome. God can be quite fearsome too, but uh, we've been talking about the good thing. Thank you, Carolyn, for the way you've led our service. Well, you've been on fire, that's good. We're really taking leading us to heaven. Don't need my sermon, it's been good. Uh, uh, reminding us that God loves us. He's a God of love. And he cares for us. And he's compassionate. I don't think we had that word compassion yet this morning, but we have in recent services in the past. So isn't it good that uh, we've got a good place to go to with a good God to go to with him? In fact, in Hebrews, I've got the quote here written out. I won't need to look at it in my Bible, but you can take, if you're taking notes, it's Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. And it tells us that the believer, that you and I, I trust, have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. So it's a happy place. To the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men. To the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Isn't that good news too? To Jesus, that's good news as well. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. All good things there about our home to be. Oh, I'm looking forward to getting there. Can't wait. Today we are in heaven. Oh, well, I trust that that is a prophetic statement. Yeah. It would be nice to be there today, wouldn't it? But maybe we've got another 10, 20, 30, 40. How many years can you go, Ron, before you find it? Can you get, get a telegram from the Queen, do you think? Some might think. Very soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's something to look forward to, however, isn't it? This uh, trip to heaven. And uh, I've made these statements so far. It's a very real place. It's the place where God is going to be present. That's where he lives. It's the place where we're destined to live. And uh, coupled with all of that, of course, is, well, it's the place where... Jesus is. And uh, I just turned to Acts 1. Jonah's already been there uh, talking about the resurrection of Christ and then uh, the disciples being told not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit has come. And uh, then they're go, going to be witnesses uh, throughout the world. And at that point, verse 11 says that... Uh, Sorry, it's uh, verse 9 says that he was taken up to heaven before their eyes. Well, it doesn't say up to heaven. He was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. But verse 11, then uh, an angel uh, spoke and he said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Heaven is mentioned three times in that verse, but you only caught it twice, didn't you? Because you're looking at the New International Version. It says, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? The uh, Greek, and I did check it out this morning, this very morning. Greek word is Oranaeus. Not Uranus, but Oranaeus. That's the Greek word for heaven. And that's the word that you translate it here as sky. And in fact, if you really do an in depth study of heaven in the Bible, you will see that there's three or four different uh, descriptions of heaven. And yes, the sky, what we see when we look up, uh, is the heaven or the heavens. God created the heavens and the earth. That's the sky. Uh, and uh, what's in the sky? How far into the sky is the real heaven? Well, that we don't know. And how long it's going to take there? Is it going to take us an eternity to get there? I don't think so. You know, 
There'll be a different concept of time and space when we're out of these physical bodies and out of this physical world. So uh, Jesus has gone to heaven and he's going to come back from heaven to take us to be with him. That's uh, the fact of the matter. So heaven is where Jesus is right now. Point number five, heaven is a city designed and built by God. This is the bad news part of it as far as I'm concerned. I'm a country boy. You can take the country out of, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. I like the wide open spaces. And yet, I see heaven described as a city. Horror. I don't like that bit at all. And what's more, it's got streets that are paved with gold. You wouldn't want to walk on a street paved with gold. I like the story uh, that I read as I was researching this, uh, that a rich man on his deathbed pleaded with God to allow him to take something of his earthly possessions with him. A ludicrous thought. He must have been dreaming, right? Well, he did this negotiation with God, and uh, God's reaction was that this was a most unusual request, but since, let me read it properly, since this man had been an exceptionally faithful, permission was granted for him to bring along just one suitcase. And he arrived at the pearly gates, and uh, Peter was there to greet him. And Peter says, what's that suitcase you got? You can't bring that in. And the rich man says, I've got special permission from God himself for me to bring this suitcase. And he handed it over to Peter. It was heavy. And he opened it up. And Peter says, ah, you brought pavement. <laughs> Gold. <laughs> I mean, what's valuable to us here is going to be worthless to us and probably should be worthless to us now. Uh, so that's point number five. One, it's a real place. Two, it's where God dwells. Three, it's the Christian's home to be. And four, it's where Christ is now and forever will be after he's come and collected us a lot. And point number five, it's a city built by God. And uh, I've got a couple of Hebrews uh, quotes here, and I'll, point, I'll give you point number six while we're looking at it. It's Hebrews chapter 11. You might like to turn to that. I did have a bookmark in it. And uh, it's, uh, the, point, the two points that I want to make is that it's a city designed and built by God. The point number two about that is that it's a better country, and I didn't look up the Greek for country, but I like that idea of it being a country. A city, country, how, how can you combine the two? But I like that thought of it being a better country, a better place. Uh, a perfect place, in fact, where there's no locks needed, no fear, no tears, Revelation 21, all of those things that we have to put up with here on earth will no longer be a burden to us, no longer be a shackle, it'll be a better country. Hebrews 11, it says in verse 10 that uh, we're looking, or Abraham, and we now too, are looking for a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Sounds good, doesn't it? I think if God does something, he does it good. He does it right, first time. So that's comforting in itself. Uh, then further down in verse 16, yes, that the believers were all looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not uh, ashamed to be called their God, but he has prepared, they, the faithful ones, have prepared a city for them. So if all that is true, and much more is true, because I haven't even read it to you, better turn to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and uh, verse 9, if all of that is true, and it is even more true than true, if you like, uh, because verse, eight, verse 9 of uh, 1 Corinthians 2 says, however, as it is written, 
No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. He's prepared it all. Well, he's working on it. John, uh, John 14, verse 2. Jesus is up there preparing a place for us. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. The trouble is, verse, point number seven. Yes, if not heaven, where then? Have you done your homework? Are you doing your homework? Are you on the road to heaven? Because if you're not, you're in big trouble, folks. And uh, the alternative is not nice. You might say that uh, hell is worse than the worst that can happen to you on earth. I mean, if things are not nice, not perfect, not well with you here on earth, just imagine what it might be like in hell. Well, hell, I don't think is a Bible word. It's a word that's been made up uh, by the translators of various scripture. I think it was originated in Catholic tradition. But there's words like Gehenna and Sheol and Hades talking about the place of the dead, the place of the dead without Christ. It's a place of fire. It's a place of torment. It's not a nice place at all. So heaven is a better place than the alternative. Point number seven, the final point. It's a better place than the alternative. What about John 3.16? God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. And perish takes a long, long time if you look at Revelation. So it's not something to prepare for or look forward to. It's not something to do nothing about or you'll end up there. I uh, uh, am into Matthew chapter 7 at this point and it's talking about uh, the, uh, I hope I've got the right chapter, verse 14. Yes, it is the wide or the narrow gates. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Go out and buy your GPSs. You'll need them to find that narrow gate. Don't miss it, will you? Uh, make every effort to find the narrow gate. The trouble we have is that we are carnal the flesh is very real and it's hungry. It's always demanding something of us. The spirit, on the other hand, is hidden away in a corner of our being and we hardly know it's there unless we feed it in prayer and Bible reading and devotion to God, praise to Him. So feed the spirit and, uh, and neglect if you can. Oh, it's a very hard thing to do, but neglect if you can the desires of the flesh which demands so much of us and leads us on that broad way to destruction, to perishing. The Bible speaks of the saved and the lost. It speaks of the carnal and the spiritual. It speaks of heaven and hell. With regard to the saved and the lost, well, you're going to be lost Unless, of course, you learn to trust in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, verse 9 says that uh, we, uh, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in his heart, and here it is again, that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. And, of course, if you do that, you confess, if you believe, uh, then that will be a life-changing experience. I conclude with uh, a, a story of yesterday. Uh, 21 years ago, I was sitting in this room with, uh, with uh, Jared Garth and with uh, the Canadian guy, Stuart, I can't think of his surname, he was, he was there yesterday, and with Hank van der Steen a Dutchman who migrated as a young man to Australia. 
a godly man. Amen. We were there at uh, Full Gospel Church, it's called Oak Point now, celebrating Hank's 80th birthday. 